So good afternoon. Welcome to this very frigid day for the Active Teaching Lab on Learning Analytics. Hopefully we can warm up uh, the room with a pretty uh, enticing and some discussion. So today's lab, uh, just to give you an idea of how sort of structured it, where we're heading over the course of the next hour, uh, start off with a few introductions. I see there's still a few new faces to the lab, at least for me, so I want to get to know who you are and what brought you. Um, secondly, I've prepared a, a larger sort of broad strokes discussion of what learning analytics means to you and how you and your uh, role on campus um, are interacting with that. There's a little bit of a demonstration that I'm going to do um, with Canvas New Analytics and Kaltura for those who are not, um, very familiar with uh, analytics within those two features. I'm keeping in mind that learning analytics is a massive conversation. I'm going to try to talk sort of in micro detail um, to the extent possible and focus mainly on Canvas um, and Kaltura. Um, just to make sure we're all still on the same page, or at least near the same page, and hopefully by then the refreshments have arrived. Um, just sort of a check-in with that. Uh, hypothetical scenarios on the ethics of using learning analytics to that test you. And then just sort of in the end, inviting some of the uh, Do It AT colleagues to talk about future directions and future <coughs> questions that learning analytics um, should address. So since we are sort of a smaller group today, if we could start off with your name, what department or school you're in, and also what you'd like to know more about. Um, would like to begin. Andrew would. Okay. <laughs> Actually. Andrew, go for it. Sure. So I'm Andrew Turner. Um, I'm part of learning for the management team, which is in view with academic technology. Um, I do some work with learning analytics, um, specifically with the tools that I support. And I guess I am interested to know about what other tools people use and what kinds of questions they have and what kinds of things they would like to learn about their students using learning analytics. Awesome. Kenny? Um, Kenny, I'm a grad student in the kinesiology department, and it feels like I've been to a few of these labs on learning analytics, and we've kind of been told to um, you know, be wary of what Canvas is currently offering, so I'm also interested in other tools people might be using, or what can we do within Canvas to make it a little more useful for us. Do you think it's useless? Not super, but I mean, it feels like right now we're just getting, you know, page views and participation. Okay. What do I do with that? Cool. All right. Awesome. Lauren. I'm Lauren. I do language stuff. Um, I do some work with Canvas and on campus for about the past six years. Okay, awesome. Brian Powell, also from Zoo Academic Technology. I have our online course production and media production services. And this is just an area that I feel like I need to be better informed with, so I continue to show up at things that can help me be a little bit better informed. I'm Margaret. I'm a student at the iSchool, and I'm here working with Daisy and with John, and the Active Teaching Lab. I'm John. I'm from the uh, Zoo Academic Technology as well. and to be back here. <coughs> I'm Rosanne from Integrated Biology. Um, I'm an occasional participant. <laughs> uh, I, I really don't know much about learning analytics, so I'm here to absorb as much as I can. I help with our department's online courses, especially for things summer. So I think this could be helpful for me to know so that I can let others know. My name is AJ. I work um, in Do It Academic Technology for IPA Education Technology Academy. And um, similar to some people, I'm kind of like thinking about how I'm going to use this, if I'm going to use it. Um, 
I'm also particularly interested in um, like students and their privacy and their data and stuff like that. Uh, I'm Jessica, I teach in biological systems engineering, and I'm especially interested in the context of developing an online course, okay. so how might I use that differently in the face to face classes I'm used to versus mm -hmm. online? For AJ and Jessica, just for what I'm hearing so far, do you think there's a distinction between analytics at the online, purely online level and in a face to face? I guess I was kind of thinking. The of use of analytics online. is being different? Or? I was only thinking about it online, but okay. I think I was thinking narrowly. So. Okay. So my name is Mary, and I'm a faculty assistant at the Department of Psychology, and I'm teaching um, a comp course that's also a blended okay. course. Um, this semester, so I'm really interested in um, whether there's some tricks of using Canvas for students to like improve their performance. Awesome. Okay. Welcome. All right. So it sounds like we have a mix of instructional or instructional faculty, technical faculty, and we can't forget the Cliff. Oh, our I, resident Canvas. Uh, uh, Cliff Cunningham, work with the Learning UW team. My issue is just making sure that I have an exhaustive list. Of where we can where we can plug in because I, I like it. there are times with the Kari's with the initiative coming out of Kari's group with what Canvas currently offers with the um, assignment or you know course analytics versus individual assignment analytics. I'm just trying to make sure I understand all those objects so that when I talk to people I can keep them also. And if there's th uh, uh, other third party tools people are using, that's like awesome, but a little freaky for me. So yeah, let's find out. Yeah. All right, sounds good. So because we kind of have a mixed uh, mixed group, um, I want to start off with the definition of learning analytics that's been uh, offered by the UW Madison uh, Learning Analytics Roadmap Committee. It's an undertaking of activities that generate actionable data from the learning environment intended to improve student outcomes by informing structure, content delivery, or support of the learning environment. And so far, we've already discussed in three different ways, I think, a blended environment, Mary, in your instance, Jessica and AJ, sort of focusing on uh, an online iteration, and as well, um, sort of face-to-face -face environments are equally positive. So I'm going to give you a few minutes to think about these um, these questions with your table mate and share when you're ready. So what are some of the examples that you already collect from students? So it's examples of data that you already collect. When and how are you collecting this data? Is it an online every single day or is it once a week? Um, how do you as the instructor or adjacent faculty member analyze, parse, and examine the data? And for what purpose? Is it predictive, so to anticipate a design element for a future business course, or is it a way to adapt to the changing landscape of the biology course that you're currently teaching? So I'll give you a few minutes to think about those questions, and then we're going to dive a little bit deeper into that. If you're ready to just well, let's chat, let's think so first. Hi, I'm Jessica. I'm a teacher
If I can bring an online shop and not get that, it's really sad to me to say that. Uh, that I think about it. I don't know what I'm also a TA, I also a Yeah, 
All right, so I think we can probably get back into our smaller larger Could take one and pass that on. Thanks, JT. There we go. Take one and pass that on. <laughs> so in some of the discussions that I was able to hear, a lot of the information that I guess was being shared is, you know, we can get certain data points, but what do we necessarily do with them? Jessica and Mary, would you mind sharing sort of the conundrum that, you, that you're facing in your course? Well, like, I mean, some of the, like, easiest data available, sort of, like, page views or, like, mm -hmm. time spent on assignments, but... What from your that? perspective, yeah. 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 from your perspective as the instructor, from what's the challenge? You know, how do I know they're like actually looking, engaging with it, or just you know have the browser open, or what? You know, it's not actionable data for me. Okay, like, it's data, but there's nothing I can really do with that to any with any reliability. Mm -hmm. Okay. In my personal opinion. I think we're definitely going to get to the point. It would be actionable. It's one of the things I struggle with, too. Yeah. And I think, um, who, who was it that mentioned the privacy concerns, AJ? About what kind of data are you collecting out of your ITA programs? Oh. Not, do yeah, not, not much in terms of that kind of privacy. I'm just saying, um, in part of our discussion, I was saying, too, like we have a pretty small student body. So okay. most of the data is not this kind of system system report kind of okay. thing. It's mm -hmm. more an actual survey or just like a conversation. Sure, that's yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Um but that's easy because it's manageable because it's a small student body, right. relatively speaking. Mm -hmm. But what I'm worried about what I try to keep focused is eventually our students become college students. Right. My kids will too. Maybe I will someday again. And it's like what kind of things are we collecting mm -hmm. um, as we start talking about like the digital student ecosystem yeah, who's housing uh, who owns it what are they using it for and it's interesting that you mentioned a survey which is something i assume that you and your group have created yeah, yeah. and then but kenny was having a, a different conundrum of what data do i need to collect or it was how do i know what i need when i need it yeah you know like i mean we have all these data points you got everything in your grade book you got the analytics off of canvas but you know, how do those mesh and what of those things do I actually need or want? So to make it actionable, which is what right. just All right, I was wondering if you could address the origin of this document. I would be happy to. If you don't mind. Please. Um, <clears throat> I think everyone has a copy of it. Yep. So um, one of the programs at Academic Technology runs our fellowship program, so we get instructors and and on a regular basis, like for a semester long program, to talk about a problem or a question or an issue that we're discussing on a new or campus. And a couple, two springs ago, we had a fellowship on evidence based teaching. Um, and we looked at a paper that had this taxonomy of different um, types of uh, learning um, analytics. And um, we basically pared it down. It came out of a paper that was. Um, from a couple of Australian publishers that actually use machine learning techniques and stuff that is way beyond what I can explain to you, even if I had a lot of time. There is stuff on the website and on the <coughs> there, but basically what the fellows did and what they found really helpful and what we can continue to do is just talk about these six, six basic different approaches that we like to think about. So a few years ago, if you said learning analytics, um, people would think it was all predictive learning analytics. I want to prove my student is is not likely to succeed, and do I need to do something in the first couple weeks of class? Do I need to reach out? So really kind of broadening the um, landscape and realize that a lot of what you do as instructors right now can be considered learning analytics. So um, you know, Bob was just talking about how he uses a pre-class survey to, based on a reading, and then he'll you know use it to report back out to the class and then address kind of focus his topics on on the areas that the students um, need to focus on. So that would be maybe individualized learning. He's kind of customizing his training. He's also uh, doing some, you know, accessing their learning behavior. So there's different things that you can do with learning analytics. Um, so that's this document just gives you an example, a definition for each of these, and then also talks about the questions that you can, that these kind of, this data might help answer. So we also like to 
it just really, um, I guess, be really clear that we don't want it to capture data just for data's sake. It should be actionable. Um, we also consider it very analytic to be course level, also the instructor has control over it, and it really should be what questions do I have with your data that can help me answer. So that's kind of the high level. Right. So as, as this is getting now socialized out on campus, how, like, I, I, I'm, I'm sure we were just discussing how you sought out from faculty what they wanted, but as you're now kind of getting this out there, how, like, what's, do you have, like, a, a satisfaction ratio, rate, ratio yet, or a, a percentage of just people are going to say, that's good, that's what I'm looking for mostly, that's great, or are they kind of saying, oh, but I need this weird, it's sort of similar to thinking, yeah, I might need something more of one. So, yeah, so just, yeah, how, how are you finding it received? Well, this is just a little tiny step in our yeah. cultural growth and understanding about learning sure, analytics. Sure, um, sure. Yes, um, learning analytics is a change effort, and it does include technology. And yeah. so we're actually in the process of kind of building some infrastructure so that we can have more tools. Okay. Because we do hear from instructors, oh, Canvas analytics, maybe it doesn't do me what I want. It's not it's enough. Mm -hmm. I want more. I want to aggregate it. Uh, so, mm -hmm. yeah, this is just a little tiny piece of it. We used this um, last semester. We asked the fellows to think about like their teaching strategies already and think about how they either were using learning analytics, you know, just kind of as a reflective thing. Are you already doing some analytics or are there some things you want to try with your class? And so they wanted yeah. some use cases. Um, that were also really interesting. I didn't bring any of them um, down here, but it just kind of helped to think about it and reflect yeah. on different ways that you might use it that might that could support students better. And then speaking of some of the, I guess, the tools and the new features, um, if for those of you that actually that have your computer, if you could log into the Canvas site, that's at the, the address at the top of your activity sheet. Um, there is a quiz that I created. It's the hardest quiz you'll ever take, but it's going to help us see some of the newer features of Canvas Analytics, just to sort of demo those. Um, if there's one person that could get the wrong answer, that would be great. And if one person that could take a really long time to get the right answer, uh, that would be great. So as soon as you get into the um, Active Teaching Lab sandbox, you can select quizzes from the left-hand navigation pane in the new analytics quiz, um, spring 2020. I'll give you a few minutes for this grueling. If you're having any trouble accessing that, please let me know. Has everyone passed? Take the quiz. Should I? You want, you want me to wait? You said you wanted no, to. No, go ahead and take it now. But to be get slow it. in getting the right answer? Or okay. If that's what you want to do. Okay. I'm slow. All right. Have we all blown the curve or bombed it? It was a hard quiz. And in the meantime, I'll just take the, the opportunity to remind you as well, for those of you that are new to the Active Teaching Lab, on the Canvas site, we have the electronic copy of this activity sheet where you can link to all the resources that we have. As John always mentions, the paper copy, all the links are broken, everything is alive and well um, on the digital version. So looking at our sandbox again, if you see over there on the far right side, you see a new tab for new analytics and click. You're going to be my wingman on this one, right? Okay, all right. So we have a tab for new analytics, and this is for some of you that are sort of getting new into this. Clicking on new analytics will allow you to see some of the weekly online activity. And uh, Mary and Jessica, this is something you mentioned, page views, uh, participations, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see everyone who is logged into um, the Active Teaching Lab um, sandbox page. But because I just gave you a quiz, I want to find out some more data about this particular quiz itself. So because it's a course grade and I've assigned it as a grade, going here, we'll see the new analytics quiz. So far, so good? Just as an introduction, if I'm losing anyone, please let me know. Mm -hmm. What? So you're only seeing this because you're the instructor and we're not seeing right. it because Exactly. You're so I'm the instructor of the course. So put myself in the position mm -hmm. of just the teacher. So seeing this quiz, I can see, um, you know, the either the curve is, you know, blown by one person, or there's a lot going on, or which is very 
Um, very, very smart. <laughs> Some of the options that you can have in this instance, you can message students who maybe have not completed the quiz or clip them. No, 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 keep going. I actually saw a request about this just um, this week. As a way, you can message students who haven't completed the quiz or they bombed it or they took five or six hours to complete this one question quiz. You know, was there a technical difficulty that you encountered that you might um, want to address? But from my perspective, just as someone who's getting into Canvas new analytics myself, I don't necessarily think that this is the most satisfying array of information that you um, can necessarily receive. And so some digging that I did on my own, um, I found out that going back to the assignment itself, opening that back up gives you a whole host of, and I can go back through that again, clicking on that assignment, the back, the sort of the, the nuts and bolts of the assignment, and then clicking again specifically on quiz statistics gives you a whole host of different information that is a little bit more relevant and a little bit I think more perhaps more informative about the way your students are performing. Um, so here I can tell that five um, respondents um, answered the correct question. Um, I have a fees that are a nine. Um, you can also see that the average time on the quiz um, somehow two minutes and three seconds that might have been because of clip. Um, just to see um, some of um, let's see some of that information. Bob, are you okay? Yes. So I, and I am not an expert in this. Okay. This is all well, my self-discovery. So. My, my biggest complaint with this is that okay. when you make formula-based questions, the statistics don't work when you have formula-based questions. I think like it's just so much. And that, uh, the question and you, type called. Uh, yeah, so like if you make one, type. essentially like if you have like some mathematical problem, mm -hmm. you can put in, you know, each, like you just put in like an X, which that X is, you know, one, two, three, four, like randomly. And when you look at the analytics of that question, like okay. it won't break down for you, like what percent got it correct. Mm -hmm. It just said like, everyone answered, <laughs> like everyone did it. Oh, like, so in terms like, of like completion versus the, yeah, so whatever it tells content you how they completed it, but it doesn't say like what, you know, like on a normal question, right? It tells you like how many answered. Sure. But I think, I guess, because everyone's answer is different mm -hmm. and like, doesn't well, let's see maybe if I click on so then, like, I, I have to go through and like manually like figure out because I like to know like okay what was the most missed question on the homework but sure. if a lot of them are formula questions I have to figure out like really which one was most <laughs> missed or maybe I'm just like completely missing something no, but no, that's really fine that, that, that <laughs> might very well be I'm kind of surprised if it doesn't but that's that yeah be. but that that is because the formula-based questions, because there are different ways of doing formulas to get the right answer. So, so like there could be 10 right answers, okay. but still, even if say there's 10 right answers, did 80% of the students get a right oh, answer oh. or? So these would be like multiple, yeah, answers, like multiple essentially, answer questions. You know, say there's 10 mm. possible questions. Mm -hmm. So a student got one of 10 questions presented to them. Oh. And it's all the same like wording, it's just a number is different. So like, you know, student A, their correct answer might be one, and student B's oh. correct answer might be three. Mm -hmm. I see. So, you know, student A and student B both got it right, but when I look at the analytics, I can't tell can't that. Tell. It just says that, like, student A and student B so, answered the question. All right, and so can I clarify, this is when you created the Canvas quiz, you used a question group? No, it's called, like, a formula base. Like, it's the type of question is a formula okay. question. And then to circle back That's, to the original sorry, topic that I she made. Like, <laughs> I just want to clarify, is that a Canvas quiz? Or yeah, 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 in a Canvas quiz. Nope, it's nope. Canvas. Canvas. Okay. That, yeah, that's, I, I do know there are those uh, question types that I've not really dealt with. And there yeah. it is called formula question. Formula question? Yeah, yeah. Yep. And I wanted to circle yeah. back to the original definition that we just you know, we discussed about whether or not this data is actionable. What would you do? So you're looking for the specific information so, about whether or not students are giving certain types of responses for you in your case why is what type of action would come from that data so i pick the most missed homework question okay. and touch on it in class okay like, you know whatever students had the most trouble with i go over that and so i want to be able to easily know which was most missed but it's like it's a lot of work now to figure out <laughs> which was the most missed 
I'm just being lazy. I want it to be yeah. easy. I don't think you're being lazy at all. It seems like you know, regardless yeah. of how much time they either got it right or they got it wrong, yeah. I should be telling you. It doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. So that's yeah. really yeah. weird. Well, thanks for bringing that to our attention because yeah. hopefully there's a workaround. Yeah, that's someone find the solution. I mean, <laughs> like, like, so. it's not a workaround. You could just, like, your final question could say, which question would you like to discuss in class? And so then it's more of a survey. Oh, like, which one would they rather do? Mm -hmm. It's not only, I don't know if that's always correlated with how well they Correct. do, yeah. though. But yeah. yeah. It's just a quick workaround. <laughs> which one yeah. you got? No, 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 thank you. Don, do you have a question? No. <laughs> I guess one question that I have is for like paragraph based answers that the instructor has to go in and label correct or incorrect, these statistics probably aren't useful until after you've gone through and corrected things. Yeah. But even then, does it show? It tells you like for like a short answer question, it'll say like, you know, so many students we're in like the top bracket of scores, so many students were in the middle bracket, so many students were in the lower bracket. Okay. So like that's helpful to me. Like even yeah. if I don't know what they answered, I still know like, oh, I had a lot of students like lower on this question. Yeah. Actionable, I can do something. Right, awesome. But I mean, in theory tell you that someone has not submitted. Right. So if you have a large percentage of individuals not submitting that, hopefully that sums up over time. I don't know if it would tell you how much time was spent on the short answer. Not that that necessarily is relevant. I don't know if that's relevant information, but. So when you look at, is there a rollover on that that talks about sort of, there's the, no, no, sorry. I'm wondering if there are any, yeah. This tells me the, the individuals who successfully passed. But nothing about the time. So if you go into like says, each individual student, you can see how long they took. Yeah, well, that's a great question. I think you. Can. You can't. Yeah. If, you, if, if you go like oh, into the speed uh, grader. Uh, yeah, this is the. I'm sorry. There's so many routes <laughs> you get to data, and I can't keep track of where yeah. all the routes are. So okay. if you like, if you're in the grader, you can see like each student's submission and oh, each student's all. submission. Yeah. You can. Unfortunately, there's 500 people in the course. Yeah. So. Yeah. so so you can see what their time less than one minute. Or you see that? Um, like the box. Uh, less than one minute. Um, and that was, I think that was for me. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. For whoever. Oh. If you go to Gradebook, you can go to someone's speech if you wanted to do that. Okay. There's a way to like get into it. I'm thinking about possible ways to work around the things right now. You don't have the analytics to work the formula question, though. Right, no, using the formula question, ways to work around your issue of not yeah. knowing. Um, looks like students can get feedback for right or wrong answers. Are they getting on? Are they getting immediate feedback when they answer a question so that they know if they got it right or wrong? Sometimes they, sometimes I give them like hints, so they get multiple attempts. Okay. And so some questions have more feedback than others. So I can, <clears throat> yeah, I guess you can see. The, well, the reason I'm asking that is because maybe at the end, your last question could be a different kind of question, not a formula question, where you ask them, which formulas did you have the most trouble with? And then you'll get yeah. that information to you throughout it. That. Yeah, um, I know it's not clean, but yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I, I don't know how long your quizzes are. And I can just go through and like sort them manually. It's just like it just seems like it should be able to do that. But yeah, I'm looking at this question. I can also see sort of the back end why that is awkward and like that because you can have you know with it plugging in whatever number. Yeah. Okay. It still knows how many marked right and wrong. John? Right. Or JT. Could you go to the quiz statistics yeah. button? I don't know. Just real quick. I do want to just briefly mention that um, as of March 2020, this new interface, I believe, is going to be the default interface for analytics um, within Canvas. So we have a lot of links that are on the activity sheet as well. We're going to drill down into some of these points about whether or not formula questions are the, problem, the problems of formula questions or other different interfaces and ways. 
to visualize student data in Cliff, yes sir. Um, I just played around, uh, your pointer is on it right now, the student and app analysis button. Down so have you, have you looked at exporting any of those? So yeah, so okay. and does that essentially push? that's what I have to do. Okay, right? okay. Yes. Because that does push out a, yep. a CSV mm -hmm. file that has a list, I think. So then like, right. I just have to go like manually and look through. I just wish it was like, you know, sure. I'm lazy. Sure. I just want it no, to no. be. No, <laughs> Okay, well, like all the summary statistics, like yeah. maximum time commitment. Yeah, so it's just yeah. like every time you have to like, you know, it's not hard to do in Excel, but you just. I got you. And then just to pivot out of Canvas, similar to mention you just mentioned maximum time spent on something. Um, I just want to also show within um, Kaltura, um, you can also see the maximum time spent watching, for example, a course that uh, who's elect, you know, for a lecture capture. So if you have a 20 minute course lecture, you can going back to the specific media itself. And please correct me if I'm wrong following these steps. This is just my, my own path to it. Um, going down into actions, again, um, analytics. Um, and you can see sort of here, um, obviously this is just a personal video that I've uploaded, um, but the number of plays, the percentage of drop off. So at what point in terms of completion, do people stop watching the movie? Is it before 50%, is it after 50%? Um, view time, I'm not sure if that would account for whether or not you double the speed. Um, or if you triple the speed and put on the captions, mm -hmm. I don't know. That assumes immediate natural uh, play time. Um, and then some things like likes and comments, just to give you an example of where you can find this data uh, to make it, um, I guess, so that in, in the future um, it can be for your own use. So far, so good. Have I lost the, any, any move so far? All right. All right, so we all passed the quiz. All right, so I want to give you another, um, similar to the, the example that I just gave, another sort of discussion activity related to the idea of a playback. So you've uploaded this 20 minute lecture capture in Kaltura, and you're reviewing the media space analytics that we just looked at, and you learn that drop off begins at 12 minutes, so people stop watching at the 12 minute mark. No one has communicated a technical, a technical issue to you saying the Wi Fi is down in the dorm, or my computer is. Um, overheating and it crashes, etc. So I'm going to give you a few minutes um, again at your table uh, to think about this. You know your gut reaction. Put yourself in the position of the instructor. Um, what do you immediately think and why? Is that your thought? Sort of a harder question. Is just knowing that drop off begins at 12 minutes a, a sufficient amount of information for you to consider whether or not it's too long of a video? And then C or if to question the students' motivation and participation. And if so, why? How would you adapt? And if not, what more information do you need? to then move past this data point to make it actionable for your course. So I'll give you a few minutes to think about that and then we'll go from there. Your table mate again, that'd be great. Same people, same groups. Yeah, 
So one of the, just because we have 15 minutes left, I want to go ahead and move forward a little bit. Um, the document that I'm now passing around is called the Appropriate Use of Data for yeah. Learning Analytics Guiding Principles. It's another document that we've been produced and shared by
research of what the other institutions are doing. This is new because a, a lot of, I mean, we're we're ahead of our peers in, in a lot of ways. A lot of institutions have implemented learning analytics and they haven't put together the policy and the governance pieces. So UW Madison is being very deliberate and very careful around that. Um, so out of that work that that committee did, they came up with draft guiding principles and then they did um, a lot of public venues and they went to different events and talked to instructors and instructional designers and students and leadership and they got feedback on them. So there was a lot of people that looked at these principles before they got approved and brought to them and finalized in your, your last May. There's a link to a longer document that's on the Vice Provost of Teach no, yeah, it's on the Vice Provost of Teaching and Learning or on the Office of Data Management site. It actually talks more about the project and it shows in scope and out of scope data. But this, this is kind of the cheat sheet version. So um, we're supposed to be using our, our guiding principles are that we use data to for the benefit of our students, right? So it has to be a benefit to them, um, minimize adverse impacts, that we want to be really transparent about how we use data and that we are careful of our privacy and confidentiality. So this will eventually turn into some sort of a policy. Right now we only have FERPA that protects student data mm -hmm. and the guiding principles. Awesome, thank you. So from this sort of very perhaps problematic hypothetical, is there anyone that would use this data to do anything? Lasagna, was your, what was your conversation? Well, I'm very self-critical, so I would need to mutilate myself. That would be my gut <laughs> reaction. I'd say that the video is far too long, they're not interested, it's not easy. But in reality, it could say something, mm -hmm. or it would push me to think differently about the videos mm -hmm. I make. So yes, I would do. Because of length and because of? Length, content, I mean, maybe I need to uh, strategize my way of making the videos we were talking about. Mm -hmm. Maybe if I do three, it's really important for me, for the students to watch the whole thing. Maybe I need to ask my questions at the end of the video. Yeah, or a or a way you can insert interactivity into the video so that they make it to the 19 minute mark and then hopefully to the 20 minute mark right. in the end, yeah. AJ, you had a really good point about um, sort of constructing a video in terms of content. Would you mind sharing that? Yeah, so I was thinking if I make my videos 20 minutes and they watch 12, then I'll just put all the important stuff in the first 12 minutes, knowing that that's like the habit. <clears throat> and then the last could be, I, I think you were talking about some pyramid scheme, but <laughs> 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 scheme. <laughs> <laughs> I'm being funny. No, yeah. no, no, that's funny. Money. Money. What? No, that's no I was just thinking the from pyramid. the perspective of this journalistic principle of the yeah. inverted pyramid, the, the meat in the top and then you know, the, the base of the pyramid at the top and then the information yeah. at the bottom is not irrelevant, but it's not the most well, enticing. Our group, our group had the other idea is that if they stopped watching about the 12 oh, minute mark, put all of the test material in the last eight minutes. But isn't that kind of disingenuous? <laughs> and then when, when, well, it's disingenuous for the first the first time quiz. Then. And then they all flunk and because they missed the new material. And then they don't trust you ever again. And that's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Andrew, you did bring up a very interesting point about why play counts and play views could be misconstrued. Yeah, so for me, the most that I would get out of the information that's on the screen is a reason to interrogate the data further because mm -hmm. I don't know, like, I don't know, for example, if it's, if we have a 300 um, student lecture, if there's 600 plays um, <coughs> and everyone watched the video twice, but just on the second playthrough, they only stopped at the 12 minute mark, mm -hmm. for example. Um, it's not, I mean, it, it's hard to draw any conclusions about my teaching, someone else's teaching, or how students are interacting with the media without knowing exactly what the definitions of the data are. And if, and if you are based off this video, uh, I, it was, I was a little slow getting through but those first two points of visits versus plays. What does that mean? What's a, why would you ever visit and not play? Like, I, I totally misunderstood the number when I saw that. It was like, yeah. Because we, there's one of the videos we saw 70 visits, but only 22 plays. What does that, what does that imply? You can visit and maybe you get interrupted and you don't want to start playing. I mean, there could be a host of reasons why someone would engage and yeah. not go through or get even interrupted or have. Maybe if there is the transcript, yeah. maybe they're like, oh, I'm not in a place. Or I'm, I'm reading it. I'm going to read it next to you. Yeah. Or Well, also, combining these ideas with transparency, 
And in an attempt to think like my freshman and college daughter, if I knew that my instructor was looking to see whether or not I watched a video, what <coughs> is stopping me from opening up my computer, pressing play, going and taking a shower, and coming back? Right. So, <laughs> yeah, so it, this is where I have trouble with learning analytics in general in that it, am I really getting useful data versus actually talking to my students and asking them questions and getting their immediate feedback in words. The thing that scares me as well in that statistic is whether or not the instructor is holding the student that's watched the video three times to a higher standard of the student who's just watched it once and sort of, oh, well, you yeah. know. Yeah. She sure. has only watched it. Uh, well, yeah, you know, sure. being is super engaged. Yeah, watches the entire time. Right. Yeah. Huh? So, maybe this was said earlier. I was drinking my coffee at the beginning of this conversation. But I mean, this is also like classic backwards design kind of thing. So, like, mm -hmm. why does this 20 minute video exist? Yeah. You know, for what reason do you want the students in it? And have you told the students what you want them to get out of it? And is there, even beyond 12 minutes, anything that they actually should be hearing? Or is it just that? I found a video on YouTube and I thought the first 12 minutes were great and everybody can that to my students and now they're frustrated because they watch 20 minutes and I'm going to do that next time when they watch the video and so it's the communicating the objective. Yeah, maybe build on that with backwards design. Like when you are thinking about this from a backwards design perspective, you ask for what are my objectives and then what is acceptable evidence that they've reached that objective. If the acceptable evidence is they watch 20 minutes of a video, then your learning outcome needs to be revisited because that's a, then the learning outcome is watch this video. Oh. <laughs> right. Right. And even, I would see in, in some cases people even put together like little short study guides about a video that here's this 20 minute video and here's the two or three things I want to get have you get out of it. If segments 12 through 15 don't pertain at all, you can even have like a little study guide like you know, this piece is if you're interested. Right. right, and then segments 16 through 20, the ones listening for X, Y, and Z. So mm -hmm. they actually have a guide yeah. to navigate themselves through as well. Yeah. So or make that the assignment. Or make Write a study uh, guide. Right. And tell me which parts are useful and not useful. <laughs> <laughs> There's your analysis and synthesis and all of the other Bloom's cognitive stuff there. Well, ultimately, it's more important that they know the information, not where they got it. So, right. uh -huh. you know, I don't really care if they watched the video or they learned it by reading on the web. I care that they can do this problem or... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Bob's example over here was great with that. Because he was saying he's got video, media that he creates, but it's a supplement to something that he's already covered in class. So some students have a reason to go and watch it multiple times. Other students, they really want to do it. They might not know what they have I will just say, uh, even with all the caveats about data limitations, Saying one time, but you can at the very least get some interesting questions that you can then that the data can spark. So, for instance, if you were looking simply to pull up a video to shoot you, you were looking through because we're trying to understand that to Andrew's question, okay, what exactly does it mean if I drop off those two questions? Mm -hmm. uh, and we we're noticing a whole bunch of the students were stopping for 57 seconds of the video. And so, if you see a pattern like that, then immediately prompts the question like, huh. <laughs> That's interesting. Maybe I should investigate more. Why is it at the 57 second uh, mark of the minute 52 video, it's students more. stop? Sorry, 54 seconds exactly halfway through. Students stop watching. Like, or is it exactly twice the speed of? Twice the speed. Um, we're, we're still waiting. I, I asked Dan if you watch it at double speed, how it counts in the calculator administrator. He says he believes that if you're watching at double speed, it still counts as the whole time. Right. And then I went in and I watched it at double speed, and I went back to check my analytics, and they hadn't updated yet. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, analytics is like Dan did a preview practice on software. He said they say their official um, data latency to refresh can be 24 to 48 hours. Wow. So don't expect immediate uh, update. <laughs> no. Like I said, it's not usually wow. that long, but it's it is it is not inconsistent. So that's a really really good. So the big takeaway is you can waste a lot of time as an instructor looking at learning analytics and just get frustrated by it, right? <laughs>
Um, and, just, and there's some interesting questions and maybe some data that you can help you answer, right? For just being aware of what it's useful for yeah. and where you'd have to take a look at the content. And that's the question that we unfortunately haven't been able, or we haven't asked yet in, in the three minutes that we have left. How do you confront a student who has watched the video for 53 seconds? What do you say? Do you say nothing? I, and you are aware of that knowledge that the student, we talked about this earlier, you know that they're you know, shopping online or something like that. What's the line between confrontation, discussion, and just forgetting about the data? You don't forget about it. And unfortunately, it's a conversation that we've been really um, get really towards, but in the few minutes that we have left, um, so I want to go back to the questions that were asked. Are there any other additional tools that individuals in the room that are, are using to collect data about student performance and mastery of learning objectives? John. So as I brought this up, she used Google Docs, and not necessarily for data, but that has a very history, so you can go back and see a timeline of who contributed what and how things mm -hmm. sort of changed as sort of a wiki style thing. That's a lot of really rich data, mm -hmm. um, unless they just copied and pasted it into a new document and then it's just all by one person. But it's also time consuming to right. go through versus the page views or how many, you know, what's the graph look like for how many video minutes were watched, et cetera. Sure. It's a, there's a lot of trade off as far as what analytics you want and how much effort you want to put into and also, and also for what purpose? Is it for better backup design or is it for surveillance? Right. Um, I mean, frankly, I mean, frankly. Um, the surveillance is what I'm most concerned with, I think, and to Lauren's point, who cares if they watched only half the video or didn't watch any of the video? Does that show up in the project or problem that I'm asking them to solve? That's where the analytics sort of needs to take place. Mm -hmm. Any other final thoughts, questions, comments, concerns? Um, just to let you know at the bottom of the activity sheet, we uh, sort of not really mentioned at all. Um, two little details about sort of things that are uh, analytics projects that are in the pipeline. Um, a lead display, and you can get this information on the live version of the activity sheet. Clicking through these links will give you some more information about um, DESL and LEAD, which are also campus initiatives um, that I'm not that familiar with the current, at the current moment. Um, you can read up on some PowerPoint slides that are available there um, for more information. If you have other um, resources, suggestions, please add those to the activity sheet, um, maybe even after this talk. Uh, just because you leave doesn't mean you uh, we've lost all contact with learning analytics. Um, so if you could take the time to fill out a reflection sheet, definitely grab a refreshment and enjoy your beautiful hot day. <laughs> Sorry, that's right. If anybody's interested in being on the Learning Analytics Listserv, we do have, we have some uh, Broadway sessions and a community practice also. We'd be happy to have you at those events also. So just talk to me afterwards and give me an email. I'd be happy to help you. And also, I think the, the Listserv is also at the bottom. Oh, yes. Just that yep. Listserv uh, yep. enrollment is at the bottom left of the second page of the activity sheet. Thank you, Jason. Yep. Thank you all for coming. Mm -hmm.